church. In case you didn't hear me earlier, my name is Amari Williams, and I have the great honor of preaching the Word of God to you guys. Now, you may have noticed that our fearless leader, Dave Swan, is not here this morning. Um, he's feeling a little bit under the weather, has a little bit of pain um, he's going through. Um, and yet, yesterday, uh, he called me, he asked me to preach the word. And so I said, of course I will, because I love preaching the word. <laughs> now, Dave was going through a series called Healing. Um, healing the nation, and it's all based on the healings of Jesus through the book of Luke. I didn't want to mess that up, so we're still going through healing. But instead of Luke, we'll be going through the book of Proverbs. And so today, my, the title of my lesson is Healing Through Proverbs. <laughs> Please turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 12. <laughs> now, the Proverbs are, I, I remember whenever I would watch movies and stuff, they'd be like, this is an ancient Chinese proverb. Yeah. And, and, you know, we don't really talk about uh, today the Proverbs of the Bible. They're like little sayings and little pieces of wisdom, each verse and scripture, something for you to take and apply to your life. And so I decided to look at the Proverbs to see what they say about healing. And so in Proverbs chapter 12, starting in verse 18, the Bible reads, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. My first point, reckless or wise. Now the scripture here divides you and your words into two categories. Are you reckless or are you wise? Are your words like swords or do they bring healing? And it's an interesting thing to think about. I mean, when I think about recklessness, usually I think about like money because I feel like my mom probably said you're being reckless with your money or something like that. But I think of my little brothers when they're really young and then, you know, you're playing by the street and we're like, you're being super reckless. Do not go in the street, right? And with recklessness, it always seems like it's a little bit dangerous, but maybe I can get away with it. Maybe it's probably not that bad. Like, it, like, I, like Mom, I know it's a little bit dangerous, but I'll, I'll be all right. Um, you know, for us, I think that we can think, oh, you know, I have a job. I, I can make sure my bills are paid. Like, sure, I like to go out and have fun. You know, maybe I spend a little bit too much on uh, the nicer things of life, but I'm not, I'm not reckless, right? But I think we should look at what the Bible considers to be reckless. So, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Now, here, uh, we have 1 Peter. If you take a guess, it's written by Peter. Um, and he's talking to some disciples about being examples to other people. And I think that everyone here, uh, you came to Sunday service, you came to church, you want to either know God or have a deeper relationship with God. You're a disciple or probably think about becoming a disciple. And so this applies to us all. But in 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 3, the Bible reads, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans used to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. We see here what God considers reckless. Living in lust. Every single time that woman with her new sundress walks by because it's summertime, you just can't help and resist looking at her. Living in carousing and detestable idolatry, you just can't help, you know, getting dolled up as much as possible because you just want your crush to look at you just one more time. Um, you have drunkenness. You just can't put down that, that extra drink. You know, Jesus drinks wine, so why can't, why can't I? But Jesus never got drunk, and he doesn't want you to be drunk. How can you do anything positive when you're drunk out of your mind? Now, here also is debauchery. And debauchery means an overindulgence of the senses. And I have to confess that I struggle with debauchery myself. Um, certainly, an overindulgence of the senses includes overeating. Amen. And I mean, I overeat. I am 300 pounds. 
and 5'11". So I'm definitely not at the right weight. And I have to confess, like, how reckless is it to spend money uh, on food that I, I don't need? Like, I, I looked at my bank statement for the past month, and it's like, did I really spend that much on Burger King and McDonald's? Did I really spend that much stopping at the gas station for that extra treat? And I'm like, dang. And I'm trying to take care of my wife and take care of my family, but I'm just throwing money away. God considers these things reckless, but I think this is a short list that really tells us that God considers all sin reckless. Because whatever sin you're struggling with, when you finally give in, you're not thinking about other people. You're just thinking about yourself. In fact, I looked up, I googled uh, what does recklessness mean? And Google says, recklessness, when referring to a person or their actions, without thinking or caring about the consequences of an action. You sin because you don't think about your consequences. You don't think about how it hurts God. You don't think about how all that lust and you just looking at women as they pass by, how it hurts them. No, you don't consider them very much. It hurts people to know that you don't consider your actions because you don't think enough to stop and say, how does this affect God? How does this affect them? God considers these things reckless. You have to consider the pain that you cause. You have to consider the, the extra work that goes into it. It's like, you know, back in college when I would stay up late, but I have a test the next day. And I'm like, if I just skip my first class and go study, then I should have enough time to just cram. And I go and I take a test and I'll either barely pass or just straight fail. And then it's like, oh, well, why? How could I possibly not consider my family and my future family? Like, I want to be married at the time. I, like, I want to get married. I want to get a good job, but I'm not going to put in the work. I'm not going to put in the work to get good grades. I'm not considering my future. I'm not considering the people I'm going to hurt by what I'm doing now. And so you need to repent of those sins. The scripture said that the tongue of the wise brings healing. And in Proverbs 9.10, it says that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. My challenge for you is to get a fear of the Lord by studying your Bible. Tomorrow is August 1st. We have five months left in the year. Now, back in January, at the beginning of the year, the whole church was challenged to read your whole Bible by the end of the year. And so my question for you is, how far are you? Are you there? Are you on track? Did you ever make a plan? Do you have any idea what it would take? Maybe you don't. But my challenge for you is to get a fear of the Lord by reading your whole Bible by the end of this year. No matter where you are, if you really care about it and you really consider your actions, that you want to be able to walk away from the things that are holding you back, then read your Bible by the end of the year. You have five months, and that's a long time to read one book. Amen. All right. Let's go back to Proverbs. And this time we'll be flipping over to chapter 13. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 17, the Bible reads, A wicked messenger falls into trouble. But a trustworthy envoy brings healing. My second point. Wicked or trustworthy? Wicked or trustworthy? Now, I have to lift up a couple people here. Um, I want to lift up my brother Jamie. Um, yesterday, uh, Jamie and Nayama had some friends who were doing a Bible study, and so Jamie and Nayama were going to lead that study and um, teach their friends the Word of God, and they wanted uh, my wife and I to sit in, and I was like, yes, of course, but then Dave also, uh, about an hour and a half earlier, asked me if I could sit in with a study that he had. And so I was like, I have enough time. The first one's at 9.15. The second one's not till 11. I got plenty of time. That first study ran over. 
And so I couldn't be there to help support until the very end. But I knew with confidence to text my wife and say, I'm not going to be there, but Jamie and Ayama have it handled. Just tell me how it goes. And that's because Jamie and Ayama are good, trustworthy messengers of the word. I have to look at Dave Swan. He's not here today, but how many Sundays is he here? Almost every Sunday. He gets up here, he preaches the word. He teaches us how to be a disciple and that teaches us how to go out and make other disciples. We come here every Sunday to hear him preach because we trust him to deliver the message of God to us. David Swan is a trustworthy messenger of God. But my question is, what about you? Are you a trustworthy messenger? Or are you in wickedness and falling into trouble? Can you be trusted to invite your friends out to Sunday service? Can you be trusted to lead a Bible study? Can you be trusted to preach the word of God, whether it's Sunday service or men's or women's midweek, or maybe it's a devotional? Can you be trusted with the word of God? Can you be trusted to be a trustworthy messenger? Turn to Exodus chapter 18. Now back in Exodus, we have Moses. He's leading, you know, all the Jews out of Egypt. And he took his family with him. So, of course, his, his uh, father-in-law comes to see him. And in Exodus chapter 18, Moses has been struggling going from person to person, solving every single problem. Like, everything that there is, like, is this sin? Like, me and my brother are quarreling. How can we get back? How can we be unified? Moses has been doing it all. And his father says, you can't do that. You're going to burn out. And so he gives him an answer to his problems. In Exodus chapter 18 and verse 21, it reads, But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. It's the same today. We already saw who fear God. These men had a fear of God. I bet they knew the scriptures that they had. But they were trustworthy men who hated dishonest gain. If you aren't sure whether you can be trusted, I challenge you to think on whether you hate dishonest gain. You come around and you come to Sunday service. You come to Bible talk. You go to devotionals. You love hanging out. You love getting the fellowship. But if you don't put the work in, if you can't be trusted to go sharing your faith, if you can't be trusted to come to Sunday service, if you can't be trusted to preach the word and be a good messenger, then what you're really doing is trying to gain the love of the kingdom by this honest game. My challenge for you is to study the Bible this week with someone. If you're one of our visitors, we'd love to study the Bible with you. And if you're here visiting, then I know you want a relationship with God. I know you want to be a disciple. So why haven't you studied the Bible? Or if you've been studying the Bible, how many weeks has it been since you last looked at the Word with someone? Study the Bible this week. And if you are a disciple, when was the last time you studied the Bible with someone? My challenge for you is go ask your friend who's here today to study the Bible today. Set up a time. And if they say no, then you go out and you share your faith every single day until you have a study set up. And then you lead that study because you can be a good, trustworthy messenger. Proverbs is such an interesting book. Because it has so many, like, one-liners. Um, yeah, it just has word after word of wisdom that we can apply to our life. And when I looked at healing, I was surprised I only found three, really. Um, and 
yet isn't three such a perfect number for God? Yeah. You know, when it comes to the Trinity and just, I think when it's three times, it really means that it's really special to him. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 16. Right. My third point is words of graciousness. In Proverbs 16, starting in verse 24, the Bible reads, Gracious words are honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. The scripture made me stop and think about my words, about how I speak, um, whether it's in person or whether it's over the phone, if I'm on the game with my friends or if I'm listening to music. But no matter what's happening, like no matter what's going on in my heart, like how are my words? It, it says gracious words are honeycomb. It doesn't even give, unlike the other scriptures, an alternative. It just only says they're honeycomb. And, I mean, what would you want anything other to be sweet? Like, I have a sweet tooth. And I know, like, when it comes to anything being sweet, like, we all prefer sweet over it, pretty much anything else. Like, you wouldn't want someone to come speak bitter words to you, right? It doesn't help your heart. And so, I had a question something. I had a question. How do you speak gracious words? Yeah, we talked about we, we always hear you have to be grateful you have to be gracious for something you know I imagine my mom giving me uh, like a plate of food when I was a kid and it had broccoli on it and I hate broccoli and I would refuse to eat it and he's like you gotta be grateful you should be gracious for getting the meal and I didn't get it back then because I refused to eat broccoli and I would literally sit there and I, I would never eat it um now I can do it, though I still hate broccoli myself. Um, but gracious words, gracious words. And so I had to stop and I had to think about that. And then it came to me that the root word of gracious is grace. And when you look at gracious words throughout the Bible, probably about 90% of the time, it's about the words that God speaks to us. And it's about how he speaks grace over us. Grace and mercy over our lives, even when we're in sin and when we're struggling and when we're fearful, God says it'll be okay. It reminds me um, when Elijah ran from an army up to the mountains and he hid himself in the mountains and he said, God, the nation's taken. What can I do? It's just me. And God came in a whisper and he said, I'm here. And not only was he here, but he said that he had 400 who had not bent the knee. He had 400 people who Elijah couldn't see who were still going after God. And it's the same way with all of us. And how much of Syracuse is looking for God and they're waiting for someone, a disciple, to come up to them and say, would you love to study the Bible? Would you like to increase your relationship with God? Would you like to know the Bible better? And you walk right on by because you don't speak words of graciousness. This scripture reminds me of my uh, mother-in-law, Chevelle. If you know her, you know that she speaks very softly. And she always has a word of encouragement. And it's always based on scripture. That's what speaking words of graciousness is. It's not the grace that you can give people. It's bringing the grace that God can give people. My challenge for you is to change the way you speak. Stop swearing. Stop speaking crashly. Stop taking the bait to speak out of anger because someone else is angry at you, whether you deserve it or not. When your family and friends are speaking out of anger and fear and sadness and depression because of all the real struggles they go through day to day, you speak graciousness to them. I know no better way than to study out the book of John. To watch Jesus heal so many people, to really see that he's the son of God, and to look as he dies on the cross for you. Knowing that and holding that in your heart will keep you in a place where you could always bring grace to those who need it around you. So, 
healing. All three of these Proverbs talk about healing. And not just healing, but how your words can bring them. How your words can bring healing through wisdom. How they can bring healing through trustworthiness. How they can bring healing with graciousness. This is how you bring healing to the nations. But why should we control our tongues? Why should we speak God's message? Why bring healing this way? After all, we're studying out the book of Luke. We see so many times Jesus brought healing to people. But it's actually Jesus isn't the only one who brought healing to people. Turn to Luke chapter 9. We always think about how Jesus did so many great things. And it's true. I mean, he is the son of God and God himself. He did many more things than we could ever do. But in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 1, the Bible reads, When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Verse 6. So they set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. And it's my hope that we would do the same. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Father, we thank you for 